What is happening, everyone? Uh, good afternoon to our British listeners and a good whatever time of the day it is to anyone else who's locked in live and uh, and lively and ready to go. Next to my spa, as always, Quinny. How are you doing, mate? I'm good, mate. I'm good. Yourself? Very good. Very good. Um, as is the subject of the podcast end product. We've got a lot to talk about, haven't we, Quinny? Because we managed to get not one but two podium finishes in the last week so definitely going to get into some of that we've got some k-league updates to talk about as well as all of the ins and outs in the transfer market i know quinny's been dipping into the super egg goalkeeper market a little bit looking there at what the options are and i think we'll get into some of the nuances on you know what is going on in the market right now we've got a lot of people in the chat lively already i want to send a shout out to ian so straight away who's used that Amazon Prime subscription to uh, to give us a little boost over here. Thank you, Ian. To anyone listening who doesn't know what we're talking about, um, we do the podcast live on Twitch every week. Uh, you can come and join us uh, twitch.tv forward slash plastician. Um, if you're following us on social media, on, in, on particularly on Twitter, we tend to try and get that out ahead of time. Usually around about one o'clock in the afternoon on a Thursday, we'll sit down and have a good old chat about all things so rare and if you do have amazon prime which i'm sure a lot of you do you can link that to your twitch uh, login get involved in the chat and you get a free subscription every month that you can chuck out one of your favorite creators so if that is me and quinny then we appreciate uh, you chucking that sub our way make some extra use out of your uh, prime subscription so thanks ian so rare Uh, shout out snake hip simo jc all in the chat early doors lovely to have you on board uh quinny how how's your weekend? Uh, how's your game week going so far? All of that, Joe's. Uh, yeah, about a wee bit of the same as usual. We're plodding on through the summer. We're trying to get the squad in fit shape. I've been doing some really good members content over the last couple of days as well. I've redone the board. I've redone my depth. Get my targets set. I've had a wee look back at last year as well and seen how well I'd done and all that good stuff. So, uh, yeah. <clears throat> end product from last season like i've got uh, videos that be coming out a wee bit more about it you know and stuff like that but uh, you know but going into last season my end product focus was firmly into that d2 slot you know before a lot of the revamps came and it was really centered around that mcgregor card that was also pride and joy of the gallery as it were and i was on analyzing all the results and all that i'd set a target of i think five podiums three to five i think we hit five i forget i've not got the numbers here uh yeah i think we hit five so I, you know, I'm in good spirits. I feel like I've hit some objectives last season and uh, we're going to go into the next year, hopefully going to smash out some more mates. So in terms of the weekend and the last week or so, that's been my main thought process. But I have had a few teams out and running uh, with under-21s and with some MLS. And it's just been DNP hell, mate. Random, <laughs> random ones getting me here and there. I managed to pick up a wee card or two um, in the last week, unlimited and a, a wee rare maybe or something, but nothing too amazing. And I might get something this midweek, but I'm not holding my breath on it. What about you, buddy? Well, we had two big results uh, for my gallery in the week. I know we kind of touched on it during the last episode where I had some kind of outside chance um, of some decent landing in the midweek. And I managed to scrape onto the podium of Cap 220 Super Rare and had a pretty good win there in the end because obviously I think the 220 Cap modes, you don't hit like the upper echelons of the prize pools usually. So I think I might, it might've been like a tier three or four win, but I, I think pulled an absolute worldie of a card in that pool. Um, I managed to pick up a Connor Cody. And then obviously a couple of days later, his move to Leicester has been confirmed, which puts him into a team, which at this point maybe won't have cards minted next season. We won't know really until, the season starts and we see what happens to the sort of relegated teams from last season's Premier League deal. So there's a solid chance there that Connor Cody has no new cards minted and he goes to a team that should be competing in the top end of things in the championship. You've got that midweek utility with the extra fixtures they have there. Um, And, you know, he's international pedigree footballer. Quite surprised actually to see him move down a division, Um, but was very pleased with that. And then the big one on the weekend going into U23 Super Rare, which has been like, you know, hit and miss for me so far this season. I think 
the U21 uh, championships opening up kind of threw me off a little bit because I thought oh, I'm good. the competition's going to be a lot heavier there now where I thought I was only really going to be competing with Asia and America kind of uh, collectors. And that opened it up to a lot of those elite U23s that are playing in the Euro under 21s. Um, but figured I'd go out for it. And, you know, Lee Han Bomb, unique, and Bake Zhong Bum, super. Uh, keeping a clean sheet always puts me in pole position to have a good shot at the podium. Um, and on top of that, Jesus Ferreira hitting 100, Cherky hitting, I think it was at 82 um, as a captain. Uh, so, yeah, I think I went just over 500 points there, managed to take home first place and picked up your man, Matt O'Reilly, from the prize pool, which is, I think, was the best card I could have pulled personally out of the pool. Um, I think the top of the pool was Gravenberch, but, you know, there's a lot of doubt that comes over the top of his head in terms of like the grey clouds um, while he's at Bayern. Great card to have long term. But, you know, in terms of utility next season, I think... Matt O'Reilly was possibly the best card in there as far as I was concerned. Uh, I think the only card in there that might have been a bit more used to me right now would have been a Ricky Pig. Um, I'm a little bit light on U23 midfielder uh, supers in the closed season until Europe kind of reopens. So that would have been really nice for me um, to win like now for the next couple of weeks. And I think... If I do strengthen in that position, I think that that U23 Super Rare um, division for the next few weeks is like always obtainable for me. So I'm really looking at it at the moment. Um, I'm going to go in again next weekend, already looking at what's happening there. Um, and I think I've got a pretty solid entry um, for the next few weeks there. So looking forward to seeing if I can nick another podium or two until everything opens up and all hell breaks loose when the European seasons start to kick off again. So, yeah, a lot of end product. Um, I also finished fourth in cap 270 rare this week. So I nearly got another podium. But um, definitely, I think apart from the week that I won the Mbappe, I think this has possibly been the biggest game week I've had on so rare. I'd have to check through historically. But, yeah, definitely in terms of end product, very happy. Lots to report. And, uh, yeah, super happy with that O'Reilly super rare. Um, you know, you're a man who knows more about him than I do. How good can he be for Celtic next season? I mean, you've won a watch for that. If he is like the perfect, like, veerman heir to the throne for your gallery, he really is. You know, box to box attacking. You know, we're getting some great comments from Jay here. He took a lot of set pieces last year. It's hard to know who's going to come in. Will somebody else take them? Will Rogers have him on them or somebody else? But under 23, and I don't know if you heard his comments yesterday. I was just doing the Celtic podcast before coming on to this today. It will be out later. But Matt O'Reilly was interviewed at the side of the training pitch yesterday. Mm. Uh, just like, oh, back for pre-season, Matt, how's things and all that jazz. And he was talking about, oh, it's fantastic. Um, the manager's get great methods and he's not reluctant to come and sit and have lunch with us and have a chat. And da 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 da, da. And so it feels like O'Reilly's extra bought in for nice. this year under Rodgers, you know, which is... I've got high hopes for, uh, for him anyway. And to hear those, you know, you, I'm sure after we're done, he, Stish, you'll go and dig the interview out. Because when you hear the words come out of his mouth, you see him, he's bought in for next season and he is, uh, he's fantastic. Like, and his best role for Celtic under Ange, and it'll be funny, it'll be interesting to see what Ange does, but he was very much the De Bruyne of midfields, you know, yeah. powerful midfielder in the attacking spot, will help the press with the forwards and is always going beyond the striker on the ball kind of thing, you know, so... Um, I think Rogers got a great tune out of Rogic last time he was here. Madison did well in the attacking midfield spot, obviously, at Leicester. And we've seen how well he's did uh, in other teams gone by. I'm thinking about Coutinho. And I know he played kind of wing and stuff like that, you know. But those attacking mm. midfield spots, Rogers has been very good at harnessing those guys. And if it is O'Reilly, which I think it will be, I think you're, I think you're on to a stormer there, mate. And Levitt has went to Hibs. Yes. As an under-23 midfield of hell waiting to happen. <laughs> <laughs> I am extremely excited. Yeah, I mean, in terms of, you know, we've we've spoken about the wins in terms of like the game, but my gallery's definitely had a few wins in terms of moves this week. And the the Levitt one's definitely like the icing on the cake in that in that sense. Um move to Hibbs, um, by all accounts, looking like a really good one for him. 
Hopefully we'll see him hitting the heights of those SO5 um, scores that we saw in his sort of peak at uh, Dundee United. So I am buzzing for uh, the SPFL to start again. Um, I'll definitely have a, a, a much more like refreshed, regenerated and re-energised interest in that division this season. So I'm looking forward to it, Quinny. I think uh, what, what better excuse do I need now to get up to Celtic Park for a game uh, with the boys, I get my green and white tie out, get my hair cut. I'm I'm excited. I'm buzzing for it. So, uh, yeah, JC in the chat saying Hibs versus Celtic. Have to make the journey up for that. That could be a good one. A two for one for sure. Yeah. And I think the fixtures came out, so we could probably actually start to think about that now. So that's a, that's a good one. Jay, thanks for throwing that. Let's have a little look at it, yeah. But, uh, but I, I made some moves myself, mate. I went and bought some cards off the back of some transfers. Also, your, the Levitt one, you've again, I think you've won a watch situation wise. He'll be seen probably as a main piece going into that midfield uh, next season. I wouldn't be too surprised, by the way, to see him in a wide position, you mm -hmm. know, like just to just to be in space and collect the ball and stuff like that. So, Levitt could be very, very good next year. Um, but I, I went and picked up some guys off the back of some transfer news himself, guys have got loans and some other bits and pieces that are going on and it's one of the parts of the transfer window where we're all a little bit scared of but when it comes in for you or when it pays into you uh it's just like it's like getting a whole new player isn't it yeah yeah i, I feel that I've, I'm, I'm always looking around this time i think i was saying last week that i'm trying not to get too sucked into um the transfer moves as and when they happen but if you can get the right side of a bit of news you can really um really like take it home for your team for your gallery and one one sort of move that didn't quite go so well for me recently um i was kind of keeping tabs on the goalkeeper situation at Kelotaro, and they were without a number one they'd sold their number one from last season uh, and they were in the market for one but hadn't pulled in a number one until literally the week of um the league restarting um last weekend so i had picked up their previous backup goalkeeper really cheap on the market i think i paid about 50 quid for him um put him in the group chat to like my brother and that was like get on this goalie i think he's going to start and then obviously the season starts and he's on the bench so i had egg on my face in game one but this week news came out that the new goalkeeper they brought in had broken his jaw in training he's going to be out for two months so the goalkeeper i picked up has also found himself you know, in for this week on for at least maybe the next seven to eight game weeks. Um, and who knows if he does a good job, he might, you know, might hold his place a little bit longer. I don't think that the goalkeeper they brought in is like, you know, unmovable in that sense. But uh, yeah, with, you know, I've had a couple of bad hit takes with um, Acevedo is, you know, out now until probably at least September, October time with a shoulder injury. Um but this uh, guy, uh, Alejandro Arana, his name is, um, you know, I've seen a nice little price spike since I picked him up. I think his price is up four times what I paid for it. Um, Alejandro Arana is his name. Um, I think you can pick him up now. I think the last sale was about 170 quid. So, you know, his price is creeping up. Um, but you've probably got at least a couple of months there. If you're looking for a cheap goalkeeper, he's not as cheap as he was yesterday. I'll say that much. But, um but yeah, that that was another little minor win for my gallery. Whether or not I sell him on or try and use him, I'm not sure. But, you know, I also won a slow it last week. Um, so I've got an, another goalkeeper option there for the next few weeks. Yeah, I'm just looking now at like the, the sort of squad builder for the weekend. And I've got so many America and Asia goalkeepers now um, that I'm pretty much set for all of the kind of all-star Asia, America um, entries for the next few weeks. It's going to be interesting um, because I do think that I've got to that point now where obviously I'm going to look at U23, I'm going to look at your all-star and the cap modes, but I'll still have a goalkeeper or two left to maybe go into Asia or America. And it's going to be interesting to see where I do put some of these cards because since we opened up all the cap 270, cap 220, cap 240 uh, modes, I haven't entered the regionals as much um, as I used to. Um, I don't know about you, Quinny, but where's your focus lie at the moment? You know, on a game week where all your fixtures hit, obviously when Challenger opens, I guess, for you, for your gallery is a big one. And and Champ as well, because you've got a, a lot of good La Liga players there too. 
But um, do you find yourself still, I know you're a big All-Star um, pro player. Is that still the focus for you or do you still kind of hit pretty hard in the kind of regionals? I think this is the season to, you know, kind of trod your own path in that sense, you know, because, you know, especially if you've been playing this game for a while, we all know what the marquee divisions kind of are, depending on like your gallery status, your gallery value, how competitive are your players, uh, being like the all-stars, the pros, uh, 240s also have got a different place on the priority list for everyone. But I think this season in terms of like actual being podium capable, where you're going to get your podiums, where you're going to get your big wins of the season, I think everyone really does need to think about what versatility they have. So what I mean when I think about that is I normally build my gallery around, or I have built my gallery to this point around All-Star, All-Star Pro, as you've kind of said yourself, because then I've just got flexibility. I don't really care what age anyone is. I don't care if they're in Korea or Germany or anything in between, like you say, Challenger and Champions and whatever. And uh, that works for me because I then know I'm targeting all-star rare pro. Maybe I do five or 10 cards in that over the season, but the other players that don't make it into my best team, they have a chance of winning. And where is their chance of winning? If that makes sense. Mm. But this season, with the same kind of team and the same kind of mindset, all-star rare pro will still be like a priority set, if that makes sense. But I think everyone should really be on high alert every game week for thinking, do you know what? See, this week, I can actually fit my best team in. A240. Let's yeah. go for the podium. Or do you know what? My best team actually is a challenger team this week. Never normally do it, but I'm going to go for it. And for me personally, when I look at my team and my whiteboard and think about what could be my differential opportunity to win out of my gallery, if that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, I think under 23 is such an open market this season, unlike any other season we've had. We've discussed it quite a lot on the podcast, obviously. But yeah. I do think with the, the guys I've got, if I get a goalkeeper, I've got the three T's, right? I've got Tani, Trubin, and Tenas, right? So <laughs> <laughs> I've got the three T's. As long as one of them gets a move and becomes a, a nailed-on European starter, which maybe any of them could do, you'd expect Trubin to be the favourite. Um, then I've got an under-23 team that I can run out. And I think with how wide open under-23 is and with some of the roster I've got there, I think that will be something I can pull wins out of. But that doesn't change the priorities necessarily. It's more being aware of I could actually win over there and if I pay attention to the fact I could win over there and maybe, like I mentioned to you maybe about 20 minutes ago, I made some signings. I brought in a Samuel Lino, who's under yeah. 23 forward, played at Valencia last year on loan from Athleti. He's went to Braga on loan. And he, if you look at his scores last time he was in Portugal, it's like Cicinha. And he was at a team called Gil Vicente, which are not anywhere good as Braga, never mind uh, Braga. So big hopes for him, but he's under 23 next year. So with me kind of being mildly aware of Oh, do you know what? I've got like 80% of a of a team, like a, not a five players, I mean, I mean a team that could compete mm. in under 23 and I maybe a bit late on a forward and I maybe a wee bit late in midfield. And as soon as that news happens, I'm kind of ready to pounce and go and get that guy in. I know the position he'll take up in, in, in the club, FC Barcelona, as it were. The other signing I made off the back of that, just to finish the point, is a guy called uh, Yavi Serrano who again was Atletico Madrid loaned out to La Liga 2. Again, I think we've maybe spoke about him on the podcast at some point. I got his limited. He never done much in La Liga 2. But he's went to Strum Graz and in uh, a friendly already, somebody was telling me in my members section, like he came off the bench and he was a cut above, you know, and he made a maybe made an assist or something as well. So uh, quite high hopes for, for those two guys coming in. Yeah, I like that. There's lots of stuff going on at the moment, isn't there? It's just, uh, but I think that point you make about having that flexibility I think that was one of the conundrums that was going on in my head for the last game week when, and even this game week coming as well, is that I was overthinking maybe um, the power of of my U23 option. I was thinking this time last week, I was looking at, you know, Lee Han Bom and Baek Jong Bom having a fixture at home um, or, or together, sorry, um, playing in that game, knowing that if they do keep a clean sheet, you're kind of, you're already halfway there, right? But then the sort of top end of my team, I had, I did wonder, is Jesus Ferreira going to be rested? I don't think that that's going to happen now. I think they're quite happy to keep rolling him out as long as they're in that tournament. He will play, I'd expect. You don't you don't drop someone who's got six goals in the tournament, do you, in two games? So, um, so yeah, I think he's safe. Um, and I think Cherky had a question mark over him because he hadn't started every game in the French um, under-21s tournament. But now that he's out, and I think that we get into the the final stages of that tournament, you know, like the supply 
of players that are available to use in that U23 tournament right now is shrinking to the point that if I've got five players that are all starting, I should be looking at that. And this time last week, I, I had doubts in my mind because of maybe the quality or like the question marks that were hanging over a couple of players. But like you said, I think that it is wide open, not just now, but for the rest of the, the beginning, at least of the season, right? We'll see who those players are. Within a couple of months, you'll start to see who the new players that have come through start to hit big. The Wales will start picking up those cards and they will add them to their already like hefty arsenal, right? But in the time between now and that maybe two months into the season, so we're looking at maybe, I don't know, late September, um, early October, when we really start to see who's going to hit hard. We know, you know, like uh, J-League and K-League are coming to the final stages of, of their seasons, etc. That's when it becomes a little bit more difficult if you don't have the killer pieces. But... Yeah, I think at the moment I should be looking at U23, even as daunting as it can be to go into some of those regions sometimes. Because if you've got a really good all-star team, there's that. But there's another part of me that's, you know, you look at the, the cash prizes in the all-stars, which you don't get as far down in the regionals. And that can be tempting, can't it? And I think that sometimes I'll look at, oh, you know, like worst case, I should be getting $50, $50 there. Or do I try and win U23? And I think that was the conundrum for me last week was, do I aim for what I'm pretty sure I should be able to obtain with this team in All-Star and guarantee a little cash prize? Or do I take it into U23 and try and hit the podium? And obviously hitting a podium is nice. Getting a cash prize is always nice. But if I had have gone in with that team into All-Star, it would have been slightly different. I think Osmar would have probably been in place of Obed Vargas, who would have put up a slightly bigger score. Um, so I might have even found myself winning All-Star Super Air last week because of the way things went on the defensive side of that team. So I think having that flexibility, and I think that's another, that is one underrated thing about having a good U23 selection, because you can flex that into All-Star, into U23 which um, you can't off, obviously always do if your team's a challenger or a champ. You can flex it into All-Star, but you might not have the pieces to put it into U23. And I think that is norm I think that's probably a conundrum a lot of listeners can relate to, right? Does this go in All-Star or do I take it into, um, into one of those sort of regionals? And, you know, sometimes the wins in those divisions can be really nice, but you do want to be hitting those top, top places in the, in the regions. But I think, yeah, it comes down to supply. It comes down to fixtures a lot as well, doesn't it? Like how many of the big cards are you playing against this week? You know, like the, in Asia, it's always like, does Sassinia have a fixture? And obviously this weekend, something else we'll talk about in a minute, but looking at my game week ahead, do I use Sassinia? Um, I didn't this week because of where his fixture falls, right? He's got a fixture on Friday morning um, in this midweek, which means he's not going to be scored uh, he'll only get decisives, which is okay for Sassinia. He can easily hit one or two potentially in a game. But this takes us nicely onto another point that we're going to get into, right? Uh, just before we came live, So Rare uh, posted an update about the status of the K League coverage. Um, and they're actually going to, in short, they've ex expressed, you know, they're stressed out about some of the situations they're dealing with. They're not going to be able to get the coverage they were hoping to. They're still working on something. But they've mentioned that they do have a kind of plan B in place at the moment with another data um, analyst, I guess, that might be able to give them the coverage that is being missed at the moment by Opta in, in Korea, um, which is great news. I think they've taken a really sensible standpoint on it that they're not going to dive headfirst into using this. They're going to test it out against what the kind of Opta stores come out at for a few weeks maybe a month or two and see if they you know the scoring is the same as it would have been if it's left with opta which i think is important right because we need it needs we need a fair test don't we and if if we score an opta everywhere else and then the k league has this other one and their scores come back different then i don't think we should be using them i think we just have to put up with the fact that we're waiting a day or two for our scores to update but in Really exciting news for anyone who holds K-League cards. The 
deadline for entering your teams is going to change. Um, it's going to go back to that midday um, or is it a, or, or CET. So is that 11 a.m. In, in the UK? Yeah. So back to 11, which puts some of those fixtures into the next game week rather than like losing them, which means that most of the K-League fixtures, at least until Europe reopens, will be fully covered now. We're not going to have those missed game weeks where they only get a decisive unless we have you know we've seen a few times where scores don't come in at all unfortunately but definitely a positive move um i'm sure there's a few players in the chat and listeners that will be super happy about that i think that the initial feedback from the community has been very good online um what are your thoughts on it quinny it's one of those ones where i think uh... They've also been trying to make a solution to this ever since it became a problem, quite clearly, you know. And I think the change of deadline was something that was mooted quite early as an easy uh, pressure release, you know, to, to the whole situation. So maybe it's a wee bit late to the party because I think the K-League market has definitely been influenced by all this. No two ways about it, you know. Mm. Um, what influence this will have on the market on card prices is hard to say, of course, but... It's a positive move for everyone that holds. I think the K-League Special Weekly was a nice, like, kind of uh, olive branch that they held out to, to the card holders uh, as such. And I, I, I suspect more people will be happy than disappointed with this, of course. But if they are going to, uh, I don't know, there's another provider coming into this, the, the, the scene as well. But I don't know, maybe they could have done this a little bit quicker in terms of the at least the deadline change, you know, because I did feel that that was, I don't want to say the word obvious, but uh, there you go, I've said it, but quite in straightforward <laughs> you know, maybe method of appeasing the situation. It could have happened a bit earlier on and maybe saved a few people some game week headaches and, you know, some grief. Yeah. I mean, I, I was always a fan of the old um, game week closing at 11 anyway. I know, I think that it was moved probably to kind of, you know, the onboarding that they were expecting from the Premier League launch and all of the moans that he would have had from New Year's is that annoyed that they have to pick their teams before the game game like you know like the team news came out but for me personally i don't feel like i can f remember too many occasions where a bit of team news came in with that gave me enough time to change anything that that actually bared any real difference to my game week so another thing i liked about the obviously different for different people in times different time zones but 11 a.m for me meant I got up on, you know, like Tuesdays, Fridays to do my teams in the morning, got it done. And then I've got the day to get on with whatever I need to get on with. And some, in some cases, you get a bit of team news, you know, before that game, the next game week opens. So you've got that hour where you might have a bit of J League or K League team news where you can straight away slot in two or three players that you know are starting that game week. It's stuck, it gets you off on a good foot and it gets you engaged in the game week straight away. But on top of that, I just, you know, I feel like those for the three PMs at the moment, at least, I, I do, I, I spend so much time trawling the news, trying to find stuff. Ninety nine percent of the time, it doesn't make any difference to what I've already plugged in on the night before, anyway. So I just lose a day of my work week, like obsessing over football news that doesn't actually uh, end up changing much unless there's like a random injury in a in like a training or something um yeah and like people in the chat saying the same that they overthink things in the day you've got all those extra you've got four hours of of tinkering time that we didn't have before um and yeah <laughs> you like it yeah you're a fan yeah but especially when the europeans this is a temporary change so it's going to go from game yeah. week 388 to 96 or something like that so it's going to be eight game weeks a month and then i think when it comes back to the european season we'll get the change back to the deadline but we want to we want to get the press conferences involved when the european season's back on i'm not sure the 3 p.m deadline really achieved that and you know part of the the thinking that when it uh, went out at the time the deadline changed was like you say, the European audience, the Premier League audience, FPL deadlines are like seven o'clock at night or something like that, UK yeah. time. So wouldn't be surprised if this maybe was an easier way for them to maybe actually change the deadline like completely again to another kind of end of the clock, as it were. Um, because again, I, I think like making decisions, having heard the press conferences, having got the early tell on what the weekend is going to be, would add a wee bit more 
to it, you know. But there is those Friday night games, there is those games that kick off at like six o'clock, um, that will be scored and all the rest of it. So where do you draw the deadline? It's it's a funny one, but I think yeah, this this will be something. But it'll be interesting to see where it goes back to from here. Yeah, I mean it it opens up that you know the can of worms that is the rolling lock conversation again, doesn't it? And I think with the global game as it is and you know as most of us who are like seasoned players of the game we we are used to and we can make sense of the deadlines being where they are because of you know global fixture sheets and not we're not just focusing on the prem but one thing i did think about a few weeks back in terms of like the whole rolling lock situation is if you can if you're going to do it anywhere um and you know in this is probably the place where i think the mole in the park Part of the main reason with the, without the rolling locks is obviously all star mode has to shut at a certain point because you can't you'd have, you'd people with certain galleries would have advantage over people with other galleries based on the rolling locks etc and you'd have people changing stuff you know up, right up to the deadline but in one part of the game where you could employ a rolling lock which wouldn't upset too many of the people that might that probably are annoyed about the current you know, game week closing. If you look at, you know, the uh, the amateur um, competitions are free to play. There's no reason why you couldn't set the lock an hour before kickoff of the first fixture of, of the game week, which is what FPL does, right? So if you're trying to onboard, let's say, FPL users, you could make the free to play lock an hour before kickoff of the, you know, the first game of the game week on the Friday night, usually, or the Saturday afternoon, maybe if it's not a Friday night game. But obviously you can't, you could do that in each individual league, but you could, it, a, ro- a rolling lock can never work in All-Star. So you have to have like a master lock, but then you could have maybe a lock on, a rolling lock on regional. I don't know where you could employ it there, but I think you could definitely employ it in the free to play. Um, whether or not people... I mean, I think for for my own sanity, I, I would always just set my teams for the master lock anyway. But if you did employ a rolling lock into those free to play, a lot of people that come over from FPL, which I think they're expecting or hoping this this summer, you'd imagine, right? By the way, marketing's moving. Um, I know someone in one of the group chats have I been mean, noticed that when you sign up for FPL this season, you actually opt in or out of promotional emails from SoRare. I don't know if you saw that, Quinny. No, I did not. That'll be an official Premier League partnership thing, eh? Exactly, yeah. It'll be be a marketing partner now. In or out of, yeah, updates from our partners. So it's got like Budweiser, uh, you know, um, I can't even think of what they are off the top of my head now, but Budweiser's one and so rare's there. And, uh, you know, it's got a little asterisk next to it. It's like, uh, you'll only be sent so rare if you're over 18, same as like Budweiser and stuff like that. It's probably why I can remember Budweiser because it's like, oh, why have they got stars next to them? It was, yeah, Budweiser. It was the beer companies and um, so rare. But it does make you think, you know, like obviously a lot of FPL players or people who sign up for it are now going to be seeing more and more of this word so rare. What is so rare? And I think they know, you know, like that's where potentially a lot of their market is. So, yeah, rolling locks potentially for free to play might be where this starts. What do you reckon? I think that regional lock thing makes a lot of sense. And then, like, as soon as anything starts, all starting under 23 caps, they all get locked yeah. in. But if the first game it kicked off is Asia, then the only region that's locked is Asia. If mm. your team's in champion, if your team's in challenge or whatever, as soon as the first game rolls, yeah. And the, the, the commons could be an easy test beds for that or you know just make sure the technology the whatever they need to do on their end to make that happen to make sure it works you know because you know, that's the first thing make sure it works you know kind of thing so yeah. yeah man i could definitely see it i think there'll be a lot of merit in it and if you were a regional player um that gives you a decision you know you have an advantage in the region versus all-star yeah. and uh, so does everyone else obviously it's in the region by comparison so there's another uh, game dynamic in our game theory kind of situation that opens up there Am I better to deploy my best team in the region, knowing that I can make changes all the way up until two o'clock Saturday or whatever, yeah. um, versus me going just lock in with all star, lock in with cap mode, and then you know, live and die on the decisions at 11 o'clock on Friday or whatever the, the, the time in the day is, kind of idea. So, uh, terms, yeah, no, I could definitely get behind it in terms of that. The, the sort of the user interface on the website, I think they just have to kind of like add like a countdown, like at the end, you know, where it's like edit 
enter they'd have to have like a little clock that counts down like you know like this one locks in five hours this one locks in thing and then like as soon as they lock they disappear from the thing it's like you've missed the opportunity to enter that this weekend so like yeah. it's, it's smaller until it's locked and then it's like right everything's locked game week is rolling look at you. yeah i think it would take a lot of tweaking because it could get quite messy if everything's big and clunky but if there's a way if there's a way that um that they could in, in incorporate that without doing too much work on the back end maybe they did give it a go but you know i think we've been saying you know, nicholas has been quite vocal as in recent times about all the updates coming and all things so maybe this is something else that they thought about i know they seem to listen a lot to the community right and i think that yeah this is a conversation that's come up a lot in podcasts and content and it, they must be thinking about oh, is is it possible so i wouldn't be surprised if we see something like that employed in the coming months but um we've got a great yeah. one from moldy here in terms of talk, listening to the community we've had the nod already we're going to get longer format competitions we're going to get maybe some sort of monthly thing maybe a season long thing or whatever as well so the you know this all kind of started from you know what is the you know what are we going to think about for next year is it going to be all-star is it a different route to go but i think there's going to be uh, you know there's going to be stuff unveiled all the time now i think we're at the beginning of july i think this month is going to be a wee bit more of similar to what we had in june where we get lost a little slice of life bits and bobs but a point of recording we're at the sixth of June. I think by this time next week is when it's going to start to get serious a wee bit, you know, where we'll maybe get an RB jersey drop and then we'll maybe get another. We've got the, we the announced the thing this week, the pre season experience with Real Betis. Oh, yeah. It's just that applications are open, you know, like pitch your pitch, you know, shoot your shot for it. They might take you on it kind of idea. So throughout the season, man, like again, we've kind of spoke about it, I suppose, without mentioning it in this way, but like, having versatility in your gallery to notice, oh, wow, this opportunity is here this week. The head count entries on the tournament is really low versus normal because something else is on or the games that aren't played or whatever. And because you've got a little bit of added versatility in your gallery, you can seize little opportunities as they present themselves. Because as much as I, I go into this season thinking, this is the season I can forecast performance for myself the most, more than any other season, because... The Premier League is on, Bundesliga is on, you know, all this stuff. There's more po more places for money and more Ethereum and more thresholds and everywhere and all the rest of it. Um, so I'm really excited for it from that perspective. But also I think it's one of the most uncertain seasons because this is them rolling the red carpet out now. You yeah. know, they've done, you know, anyone who's listening to this podcast, you've been here for a year, two years, six months, three months, whatever, but you'll know that they've raised a fuck ton of money for this business, <laughs> yeah. you know, and they've got, the, you know, they've got everything at the tip of their fingers. There's really no excuses for doing this properly. And everything they've done to this stage has been fantastic, I think. And although speed of delivery is something that, um, or maybe technique on execution is maybe something that they've maybe lacked here and there over the last couple of years. Who, you know, really, who cares? Everything they've done has been exceptional when it has been delivered ultimately, for me anyway. So, yeah. Um, monthly the leaderboard stuff the season long i, I can't wait to see how that will roll out with experiences with money the cards so coins which we're going to want more than cards soon enough we're, we're told um so yeah yeah and you you touched on the the experience that's been announced uh yeah. the 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 kind of like betis it's, it's like four teams right from la liga that are traveling out to america and and uh mexico being able to sort of like travel on the team planes with them, stay in the hotels, you know, go on the pitch for the warm ups. It sounds absolutely amazing. Um, and it had me looking at my my own gallery. And do you know, I am, well, I was in second place until this tempted me into buying another card. But until that was announced in the week, I was the second place um, collector for super rares of the 2021 season of betis so i bought a andres guardado super rare this week for like 45 quid that makes me the the top collector of betis Wait. super rares 2021 season um so i'm tempted to enter i don't think they'll let me have it because i think i've had like a few good so rare experiences they'll probably make it you know make sure they give it to someone else so i don't maybe i don't enter just to not give any 
headaches to anyone but uh but yeah i i realized that you know i i'm in a pretty good position to apply for that whether or not i'm around on the dates is the big thing so i'd need to look at that before i did even lodge some kind of entry to it but what a fantastic um prize that is um another thing is well i'm sure there are bigger actual best fans out there than me who just happens to be a yeah. of the cards right I'd, I'd, it'd be a bit unfair for me to take that opportunity away from like a diehard betis fan um but love to see that kind of prize offered up you know those are the things that you don't really see anywhere else and we saw the content that came from the milan one and i mean that looked incredible so another thing i did notice about this which is another you know thumbs up to so rare to listen into the um the community was it includes flights from spain right so it, you gotta get your flying with the team you gotta get to bets and once you're in bets yeah. but it's not everything you know like before you needed to make sure that you were you know sorting your hotel and accommodation out for a lot of these experiences that you win which probably meant a lot of the surprises one actually went unclaimed or unused, which, you know, you don't, no one likes to see that because we're all competing to win these like incredible experiences. And then if you can't go, it's just gutting, right? But, um, but yeah, getting yourself to Betis, I think for a prize of that magnitude, I think, you know, unless, unless you live on the other side of the planet, it that's not a major expense. I think most of their, most of their user base is probably in in Europe, right? Um, and if I'm not mistaken, did it not say that it was only open to people outside of America because they want to give it to someone who doesn't live in America or Mexico because of the flight and the whole point of it is travel. UK, EU, I think they opened it up too. So I think our Japanese and Australian friends and whatever, I don't think they'll be eligible no. to enter. But it's an application-based one, which is brilliant because normally they like say we're competing to win these things and yeah. all the rest of it, whereas everyone who's just sending an email to this is saying, like, I'll go, like, you know. Uh, I'm sure, so yeah. Think... They'll probably, you know, they'll be looking at who's got the collections as well, though. You know, we saw that with the Liverpool experience, didn't we, that the kind of selection process for that game was who are the biggest collectors on the platform for Liverpool, you know, and, and it went across all scarcities. It wasn't about how much money you spent. It was about what you know, what does your, what does your Liverpool collection look like? Um, and they reached out to people who, you know, had good limited collections, good unique collections, super rares, you know, all of the big kind of like Liverpool accounts that we know of in the community were asked as well before people like me, myself and yourself were invited along to try and like whip them at, on their home ground, which we eventually did as well. So yeah. that was nice. I've actually been editing my uh, video that that should go up it's taken me forever to do but i've been flat out with stuff they've got i've got a list of like little bits of content i need to edit i'm sure you know what that's like winnie yeah my Liverpool video will be out tomorrow we had to i think uh, i don't know what sort of content you're putting out but for for any like youtube kind of videos Liverpool have to see it and give it the green light first so right, yeah. i got my i got my green light back on tuesday or wednesday so after the deadline stream with me and Harry tomorrow, my Liverpool video will be out. If you want to check it out, it's good crack. Um, I watched Harry's yeah. video. Harry's video is mean, great. If anyone listening hasn't seen Harry Trade's uh, video from the Liverpool experience day, he basically wore a GoPro during the match and he's, uh, with the help of the team at So Red Data, has scored all of his actions that he caught on camera in the game. So he got to figure out what his like SO5 score was. So, uh, yeah, if you haven't checked it out, I recommend going and having a look at Harry Trades on YouTube. Um, if not, just to see his goal that he scored. If you've never seen it, he scored an absolute belter of a goal at Anfield. Um, so it's worth it. Just, you know, that's worth the price of entry alone, really. Go check it out. But, uh, on, on the subject of content, actually, you know, you're someone who's been in the community for a long time, and I think I spoke to you privately that I feel like your own content at the moment seems to be hitting the algorithm really nicely, um, which is often the trick with YouTube, isn't it? But do you think that we're seeing algorithms start to hit because maybe so rare is becoming a little bit more of a commonly searched for term on YouTube? Um, obviously, this time of the season, a lot of people are maybe experiencing like or, or not experiencing, but, you know, coming across what is so rare. Keep, keep seeing the names pop up on screen. Um, I think Harry, again, to talk about him, he posted a 
like a, a photograph of um I think a so rare television ad that's actually running in America for the MLB uh, game at the moment. So you'd imagine that this is having an uptick in search for so rare, but um as a content person, what what is what are you where are your where's your head at in terms of like what kind of content you need to be putting out? How often do you put it out? Because I'm sure we've got quite a few listeners here who are kind of dabbling in that themselves, even if it is if it is just sharing teams on social media, that kind of thing. What are you kind of focused on in terms of content at the moment? I think when it comes to Soria content, I, mean, I put a lovely post out yesterday uh, about the Soria Down Under podcast. I don't know if you've ever listened to it. I've definitely heard bits and I've definitely caught an episode here and there before. But um, I caught I caught their one yesterday, the full thing. It was hilarious, man. I was, I was absolutely in stitches. They're really enjoyable, you know, very different to this show. You know, much, it was much more kind of, you know, giffy and, you know, fun, funny, you know, much more enjoyable in that sense. We're just boring, is what you're saying. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, we're boring. We're, 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 we're all about players and, and, and all that kind of stuff. There was, some good, there was some good stuff about that, but towards the end of the pod, give them their due, you know. But I think that really embodies it for me, is like, uh, you know, I speak to as many content creators as I can, you know, when I see them doing stuff and, and whatever. And I think um, everyone, the first thing everyone wants to do with content is everyone wants to come on and tell you all about their gallery. And then everyone wants to come on and tell you about what they think is the next big thing to come, which is all good. But you can only do videos on that for like <laughs> so long before yeah. it's it's gone. You know, like you've done the topic to death or whatever, you know. And then like, it's probably been one of the things I've kind of, uh, yeah, struggled to, to not sound a bit, not, not sound too um, airy fairy about it or whatever, but to like express yourself with correctly, you know. So when I get a video idea or I get an idea for a video, I think, oh, this will be brilliant. I'll talk about this and I'll talk about that, and then I'll maybe go to record it and then see after like two or three minutes, I'm like, this is this isn't really a video. This is maybe yeah. this is maybe a bit or this is maybe like you know, it could be a list of three things or, you know, where does it end? Yeah, 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 definitely. And, and anyway, I was talking to somebody recently who put their first YouTube video out and the, the kind of advice I said to them, I guess I would probably end this statement on with as well is don't feel pressure to publish everything that you record yeah. because like you don't need to publish it. Nobody knows you made it. You're not going to get in trouble. You know, see if you want to do it again tomorrow or you fucked up the editing or you didn't turn the camera on properly or, oh, do you know what? After I finished, I realized there was this cool filter thing or, you know, yeah. whatever. Just do it again. And just do it better. And, you know, it's so, yeah, that's probably one of the things I think people will um, quite often done it myself, you know, just record and post, record and post, which is fine as well. But again, like, um, it's one of those ones where when you're coming into the, whatever the video is, if you, you kind of need to have it formed of what you're going to talk about. So I'll get a video idea to kind of properly finish this off. And I, if I get, so if I turn the camera on and I start going, see if I'm not, see if I can't get hyped into it. Mm. Something I've kind of had to stop myself with recently. But if I can't, like you and me, Stish, we sit here before the podcast, right? I've got yeah. the tunes on in here. I'll be smoking. I'll be drinking some juice. I'll be getting all this stuff on, blah, 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 blah. And normally if I'm recording, if I got one handy, yeah, I'll have like a to-do list in here, right? Maybe you can see it, maybe you can't. Yeah. And then I'll get myself G'd up and then I'll be like, right, okay, what can I do? And then see if one of these things, I'm like, yeah, I'm buzzing about that. Let's talk about that. I'll just flip the camera on and we'll go for it. And maybe we'll edit it and delete some bits or whatever. Yeah. But if I do that and see after two minutes, I just feel like, nah, like, then stop. It's not good. It's not going to be a good video if you feel like that, you know? It's just, it's not, it's for anyone. I can hundred percent. I like to think people like me because I'm. I can come through the. I'm happy, you know. Like you can yeah, kind of yeah. feel in a, you know, whatever. And everyone will be different. Don't get me wrong. But whatever it is you're trying to send through the camera, you're not going to send it through if you're just like I feel a bit stupid or this is maybe a bit yeah. daft. Or, you know. So yeah, that's probably what I would say back to you, mate. I don't know if that works or not, but <laughs> I think, I think it's good. and do you know what? Like from from any kind of like creative standpoint, I I can I can kind of speak to that from a music perspective as well. And, you know, my computer is full of 20 years worth of music of which people have heard less than 0.05% of, right? I'll sit and make music beats all day long when I'm, when I'm in the mood to do it, right? Similarly to you, if you're not hyped up and you want to do it, then just don't like, because it comes out in the music or it comes out on your content, right? That you're bored and you're doing it because you have to. With music, like, you know, you might make something, you know, you get about a minute long into the song and you're like, this is actually shit. 
like start, start something else save it whatever maybe come back to it another day some songs that i wrote that actually did come out took about two years to finish because <clears throat> for whatever reason when i started them i was tired or whatever i got bored i had stuff to attend to and then you go back in the next day and you're like yeah your head's in a different place you're like mm, no nah, start something new then you might open it again like six months later be like what's that and then oh that was all right i got halfway through that i should finish that add a bit more to it play it on the radio mm, didn't sound really good next to that song it needs to be a bit more like this add something to it there's certain songs in my back catalog that took two years of like just going back to it and chant because it was like a minute long for like a year and a half or whatever and then um, totally get what you're saying with content as well from some you know i've done bits and bobs on youtube about so rare um, and instagram like very short kind of snappy real type stuff and you know i was doing like a um until recently like every week was doing a road to glory which then I, I went away i've been away like a lot of weekends in the last few months because of gigs or you know stag do's and all sorts of stuff so i've not been able to keep up with it so i totally get you where like i'll start recording it and then i'll watch it and i'll be like i do this every week my videos look quite similar and i'm not sure how interest interesting it actually is like people only really care like is your gallery value worth more than it was last week or is it worth less? Yeah, that could be a 10 second story on Instagram instead of a two minute long bit of content, which, you know, for people who don't make content, putting out a three minute long video is still going to take you about an hour and a half to two hours to shoot, edit, you know, cut it, freight, uh, grade it, add all of the tags to it, do the YouTube upload. It takes time, right? And like you said, if you're gonna invest time into it you gotta make just make it worth worth it when you hit upload so it's interesting i don't know how interesting that is for people listening but i find it quite interesting you know yeah i like talking about it as well but it's one of those ones where yeah again for anyone listening to this i don't know how um you know how much it will go with but again anyone who is making content and listens to this that's kind of and again like a lot of people dm me and stuff like that i'm always happy to to give my two cents and and all the rest of it, you know, the amount of these microphones that I see kicking about on videos. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <they're everywhere. laughs> I think it's yeah, just like, I think because so rare is so reliant on the community to create these, you know, like we are essentially the marketing like machine of this company at the moment, aren't we? So I feel like it's hopefully interesting to everyone listening why someone does it how it works why it works and you know like obviously there is the perks that come with that potentially if you can get people clicking your like your invite links then you might get a few cards out of it all those kind of perks that come with being part of the community i guess you know like we we've been fortunate enough to be involved in some of the sort of public events that they've done and stuff like that and that's because of the time that we've put in i guess to the content which essentially we're all like little little working ants aren't we for the for the uh for the queen ant that is so rare so it's uh i guess that's what people so maybe yeah i hope i hope people listening i hope i'm just bored people with my questions there for quinny that might have been something that we could have talked off off air but i think it i think it's interesting i mean there's a lot of people out there that will probably you know post about so rare and not really think about it that much but if they're interested in like what works and what doesn't but like you said those bits of content that last longer than maybe the game week ahead are the ones, right? It's like, these are the things people are going to be watching over the next few months, I think. And that's, yeah, interesting to see more of it popping up now. The content's there. I think so. I've removed a little bit of the need for the whole beginner tutorial thing. Like, I've got one out for this year. I'll probably do another one anyway. But they have their own one, and it's very yeah. slick. John's is very slick, of course, Yeah. Uh, and whatever. And that used to be the thing with anyone getting into it. The first thing they would do is a beginner's guide. And... Uh, yeah anyway i I won't labor into that for too long but basically the the only thing i would say on that is the first video you make shouldn't be a beginner's guide because the first video you make will be the worst video that you make and a beginner's guide is a video you want to turn out very good you know so uh, i know people will be eager to get their one out there and hopefully just but it's just one of those ones where you want it to come out good you know so think about that also we've had some great comments in the chat we can bring it we will try and bring it back on to uh, yes we had some error messages come up, Mango Wallet, and we had a bit of a, a tell into a response to a Chani tweet. I've kind of referenced, I think it'll maybe come back into July. 
but the fiat wallet might be imminent, might be quite close-ish. And mm. what you were talking about, Stish, the full market machine, everything kind of going on for the company, that feels like the, the watershed moment waiting to happen. Um, did you get that funny wee notification? Have you seen it knocking about? Do you know what I'm on about? Um, I didn't get that. I What was the notification? I might have missed that. So I think it was for cash bidding. Or it was or for maybe deposits, but it was an orange error message, and it was came up saying like error mango wallet or something. I've got a screenshot for it somewhere. Interesting. Yeah, I'll see if I can find. It. I'm sure it was in the. Uh, so, have you looked into what mango wallet actually is? No, that's all happened this morning. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, I don't. I've not. I'm not familiar with the term mango wallet. I don't know if that's a company or a kind of. Feels like a ramp kind of thing. Yeah, maybe it is. Um, yeah, there we go. I've got it here. Error. A Mango Pay wallet is required. Let's see if we can get that. Mango Pay. Mango Pay error codes. Okay, docs.mangopay.com. Okay. So, yeah, it's um, interesting. Mango Pay. Not familiar with it, but that shows you that things are being built in the background, right? Um, Ian So Rare come in and said, Mango Wallet is what Vinted use which is good because Vinted is obviously not a crypto platform. It is like a bit like an eBay phone app, isn't it? Like selling your data. So if, if Vinted are using Mango, then that makes it more of a like, you know, bank integration than a Web3 one, which would be massive. I mean, if people were using Vinted, use it. And it's that because Vin, using Vinted is easy. You sign up a few clicks, you're selling stuff. So if it's the same process, you know, once that's integrated, that's massive. I'm super buzzing about the uh, the fiat wallet because, like you said, I think it is the watershed moment, isn't it? It's that is the straw that breaks the camel's back in terms of time to hit go on everything, really, for them. I'm sure that's what we're there waiting for with a lot of the, you know, the marketing. I feel like they just, you know, they've got the loaded gun, they're ready to go. It's just get that light work in, get it, get it tested a couple of weeks, make sure that you know we've ironed out any of the creases, and then bang, get everything out. I couldn't imagine, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if we start seeing so rare popping up on Sky Sports ads and stuff, you know. Um, yeah, we might start seeing so rare as much as we see Quinny's face in there on Sky Sports News. <laughs> <laughs> we can all dream in that sense. And there was another great comment in the chat as well I wanted to bring up before we kind of moved away from uh, some of the kind of halfway series stuff. Uh, I think, it, uh, what was it? No, no. Um, Oh, Jesus, I've lost it. So somebody was thanking us anyway for the content, saying that when they started, they couldn't have got anywhere without the videos, like myself, John, Sorry Data and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, big shout out to everyone that's been making content uh, over the last little while, because it definitely is like a community-driven product to this point. We're waiting for it to be a an act, you know, mainstream, uh, you know, all that kind of stuff that we say, mass market and whatever, because it's just a big community project. Lads, trouble signing... And really interesting. On the co- oh, I think um, really Parrot Press. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, so rare. I think I had problems saying it in the comment. I was confused. I thought it was a so rare. There was problems. <laughs> I was like, oh, no, I've got trades to do, man. Don't tell me that, Parrot. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so I think it's, it's going to be, and again, can I bring this back to the beginning of the podcast? But this is the summer to get your house in order and be flexible to what situations can arise, you know. So um, make sure you make a list, you make it twice, and any of your targets, if you can get them in. like you're, And I, I don't mean your targets, like, I need to champion America forward. I mean, I would love this guy, and he's not actually that far away from me, but yeah. he doesn't make any sense. That's the guys I'm making sure I get, because when the market moves away from you, they're the ones you regret, oh, I could have got a, I could have got a, but I didn't. He? Yeah, you know? I had so many. I mean, that was why I ended up buying the Lee Bomb Unique, because I was looking at buying him for so long, uh, you know, like I was, I remember being at a gig and missing his first super rare um, because I was playing at the time and they'll miss the end of the auction by about a minute. So when the unique came up, I was like, I don't, I'm getting him because I just, you know, I'd seen enough. And I thought, I've, I still do it though. I'm, I'm guilty of it. Players in my watch list who, you know, are still on the bench and not really going, you know, out on loan to the league, leagues that are uncovered, blah, blah, blah. And then the minute they come in and start banging, you're like, oh, I didn't pick that guy up. I should have picked him up when he was 20 quid and I wanted him a few weeks ago. Now he's 200. It's like, yeah, I think that's the, that is the, that is the power of using your eyes over the data because 
everyone can see a good player on survey data, but if you see a good player with your eyes before anyone, you know, before they've got those stats to back up the, the ability, I think, yeah, I think it's good advice. If you watch a lot of football and you see something that you like, act quick before before those L15s start rolling in of 64 and you can't afford them anymore. But, um, yeah, it's good. I'm going to be watching a lot of football in the next few weeks. Um, hopefully a lot of friendlies. Been trying to keep an eye on the kind of lineups on friendlies, but, you know, lineups don't always tell you the full story, do they? Uh, I love trying to find those sort of random little teams. If you can keep an eye on the friendlies, even better, you know, if they're sort of being covered by the betting apps and stuff where you can actually watch the game. And if there is a player or two that you've heard of, or maybe a youth prospect that's being moved up into the first team that you haven't seen yet, that has cards, all that kind of stuff. I love this time of the season for that. Um, definitely picked up a few bargains down the years where I've seen something in a pre-season friendly and I'm like, that kid's starting this season 100%. They might hit you know, a hat-trick in a game and then start the next friendly. And then it's like, next game is the first game of the season. They're not going to drop him. Like He's been banging goals in all pre-season. Um, so yeah, I think, uh, be keeping an eye on the friendlies. Definitely. It's hard to get the lineups out of all of them. So get, get all the apps on your phone, get watching some friendlies, get your, get your notebook out and get your checkbook out and start signing them up. I agree, Quinny. Because as well, for some of these bigger clubs, like see like your Bayerns and whatever, when they go on pre-season tour, they do take like 40 guys. And like a few of them will go out on loan. Some of them might have cards. Some of them don't have cards, but will get cards. And, you know, but, you know, like you say, Stasha, maybe half an hour of your time, you catch a guy who played the first half. And you're like, oh, by the way, that right back's got something about him. Yeah. And then you see, oh, the right backs were on loan to Bundesliga 2 to some team that are going to play him every week. And you think, ah, do you know, I'll pick that guy up for 30 quid. And then, you know, if it, you know, it's just an example I'm painting here, but I think we're all on the same page. I've done the Winter Nationals. I spoke about it quite a lot for the under-21s. Uh, this year, I didn't actually watch enough of it compared to what I wanted to. To be quite honest with you, I watched quite a lot of the group stages, and then the uh, the knockouts would just be summer holidays. Now kids are off school and making content, like you say, some other bits and pieces. I missed a few more of those games, but friendlies give you a great opportunity to do that for the club, and particularly for some of these clubs that have got new managers in, where you're trying to work out: is it going three at the back? Is it four? What's the midfield doing now? Are they going to play with two up front again? You know, whatever the you know, the, the, the maybe sea changes, you know. So, yeah, definitely a lot of intel to be gathered from, from friendlies. No, no two is about it, Stish. Yeah, definitely. I did, on sort of like what I was just saying as well about watching a player um, and then, you know, using your eye to kind of guide you a little bit more than the stats. I bought a player ages ago. I don't know if I've spoken about him on the podcast before, but um, Fabio Blanco, who was like a youth prospect from Almeria, who then went to Villarreal, who then went to Barcelona, who then sent him to Frankfurt, where he got um, where he got a card minted. Um, he didn't play any. I don't think he started any games for them. But then Barcelona bought him and put him back in the B team. Well, anyway, he moved recently from Barcelona B to Villarreal B, and I'm like, oh. Cheeky. He looks a player, like, and he's going to be in La Liga too. He's under 23. I had his rare from before and I picked up his super rare. I paid quite a lot for it, but it's the only super rare. And obviously we haven't yeah. had Villarreal be mints before. Sometimes some of them get minted as part of the first team squad, whether or not he does, we'll see. But I liked him because his name is not what his name is. He's known as Fabio Blanco, but his card is Fabio Gomez. And I was just like, let me pick this up before anyone else clocks it. Um, so I have massive hopes for him if he begins to bang at Villarreal B next season and he doesn't get any cards minted. I'll be the only person on the platform with a super rare. It is a rookie. It's a one of 10 and it's the only one. So he, <laughs> I've just come in and I'm like, if this kid pops, I am going to be absolutely laughing. And he's one of those players. He's a really creative forward card too, mate. Yeah, proper like, twenty three super rare forward on top of your fucking exactly. O'Reilly and your Levitt. If he bangs, I'm laughing every game week, and it's like, yeah, I took it. I've taken a punt on him. Um, so yeah, I think I'll be really, I'll be keeping a keen eye on him this season because I, every time I've seen him play, he's impressed me. I don't think he hit the heights that Barcelona were hoping he would. But, you know, Villarreal B, 
could be, you know, a club that knows him as well. You know, they'll they'll know what to expect from him. And, you know, he's played at international level for Spain in the youth ranks. So fingers crossed. And and then if he gets no mints as well, because he is like a solid part of that B squad, I'll I'll be very excited about that. So yeah. yeah we've um, had some news in the chat as well. Here we go. It is an end of a generation. It is end of an era. Timber has left Ajax. Yes. So that is yeah. no Martinez, no Timber, no Anthony. You know, that team has been yep. taken apart over since Ten Hag has left, Julie. So what would you think about that? I don't see Timber walking into that team. I feel Timber's more cover for Saliba. Yeah, I think so. I, I don't, unless they're going to play five across the back, which I'm not sure suits them the way they play. Could they uh, play in that Ben White right back role? But I mean, he can. He's played there for Ajax, hasn't he? So maybe that's how they. Maybe that's why they've signed him. Maybe that's where they see him slotting in. He could do. But Arsenal have got you know a plethora of options back there now, haven't they? Um, you know, Champions League football requires a little bit more depth in the squad as well. Um, but they've done some good business, haven't they, so far? Arsenal, I think. Um, Saliba's signed a contract extension today as well. So they've got Timber, Saliba, Declan Rice, uh, um, Havertz. They're going to be an interesting watch next season. It's going to be really yeah. interesting to see how they how they uh, shape up eventually in those first few games. Um, but yeah, be, be, be an interesting watch 100% next season. Ajax will be interesting as well now, what they go and do in the market because... I think I've spoken to you a couple of times about Kaplan, who they signed from Trabs on Spore, but I think he's still recovering from uh, like an, a pretty pretty bad knee injury and then a relapse on the op that he had. So I don't think we will see him much in the beginning of the season. Um, they sold Pear Shures, didn't they? He's not away on loan. He's he's gone, isn't he? He's not there. Yeah, three on him. So they, it looks like they're going to hold on to Alvarez. He he was supposed to go to Dortmund, but that that fell through. So maybe he stays there and slots in at the back. And they got Bassi, obviously. They got uh, I think he left. Bassi's Bassi away to Brighton. Yeah, I missed that. Yeah, wow. so Bassi Bassi's away to Brighton, and uh, so Ajax paid like a lot of money for him and put a sell on fee, but they've they've lost money on him. They're selling him to Brighton for a loss, and Rangers are not getting any money for it. Wow. Because obviously, like, I actually have been slating him. You know, see, like, Edwin van der Sar and all that. They don't like him. They've been slating him this season. So I think they were just desperate for someone to put a bid in. I think they've sold him for next to bugger all, next to what they paid for him. Crazy. Yeah, I'm, just trying... Brighton. I'm sure it's Brighton. Maybe Brentford, but I'm sure it's Brighton. I always do that with those two. So, yeah, they've got Kaplan there. He's injured. Um, Gerald Hato, who started quite a lot of games towards the end of the season, he looked a good player. Um and they got like Kick Pieri coming back from loan. It'd be interesting to see who starts in that in those cent- centre back positions. But I think Alvarez maybe. Um, yeah. Um, Moldy saying Bay Junho, who is a highly rated under t- from the under twenty World Cup. Super Air ends, ends in seven and a half hours. Interesting. Uh, JC is is uh, saying that they actually took a ten million loss selling Bassi to Brighton. They paid 25 and sold him back for 15. Crazy. I mean, I wonder what that means for um, Jan Paul Van Eck at Brighton because if they've signed Bassey, they've got Dunk there, obviously. Cole Will's probably going to be back at Chelsea. But Jan Van Eck has been waiting for his place in that starting lineup for a couple of seasons now. He went out on loan um, to Blackburn and won their player of the season when he was there. The season before that, he was one of Heronveen's top performers and he's been linked to Ajax. So I do wonder if I and PSV were linked to him as well. But I wonder, um, he, you know, he's been quoted in the press saying he wants to stay, fight for his place, place at Brighton. Um, but this might change that. I'd be interested to see, you know, with him being Dutch, he's in the under 21 squad. He started all the games for the under 21s in the European under 21s. Uh, maybe, maybe we see uh, Jan Paul Van Eck back in the Eredivisie. Who knows? But, um, There's also a link here as well. The guy that was linked to Celtic M- Bayou Amber. I think he's right. at, uh, it's a Von Damien says it here. He's been linked to Ajax as well. He's got great stats in uh, 
we've seen that quite a lot in the Dutch league. Like the guys that finish, you know, there's if there's good players in the bottom half, they'll move to the top half. They do that quite frequently. So, yeah, I could see that happening if you're going to speculate on on Bayou Amber. If I say so, mm. um, yeah, that could be a great shout, Ian, hundred percent. I don't think Bassi plays for Brighton. I think he's backup. I don't think he goes in as a starter. You know, eleven million pound or fifteen million pound for Brighton isn't anything for a, a centre back. You know, he's English. I know he's Nigerian technically, but he's English, so you'll have a wee homegrown thing, and yeah. you know, all the rest of it. Yeah, interesting. On the subject of Man United as well, Mason Mount, um, big big marquee signing there. I think that'll be huge for you, mate. Honestly, like I think he'll be brilliant at Man United. I'm really intrigued by this signing because I was talking to my friend who's a Chelsea fan and I was like, you know, he's never blown me away. Um, but we know what he's capable of. You know, he's good on a set piece. Uh, he is bo- pretty box to box. He's not quite as, you know, rough and ready as, say, like a Casemiro. Um, but my friend Dan uh, Hudlin on So Rare was saying that he kind of sees him uh, a bit like a slightly, you know, like a, a a new model, Eric Christian Eriksen. And, you know, I, I can see that. And I think yeah. that, you know, Eriksen's not getting any younger either, is he? Um, so, yeah, I think be intrigued to see how Ten Hag uses him there. I was reading a really good article about his year at Vitesse before he kind of broke into the Chelsea um, starting lineup. And, uh, yeah, I mean, if he can recover some of that sort of form, <laughs> I know it's a completely different league, but... It'll be really interesting to see maybe like Mount um, slotting in just behind Bruno. Don't think he's going to take his place. You know, he's going to agree to his position pretty much cemented. But maybe Mount at the back of like a kind of two piece pivot with with Casemiro being doing doing the dirty work and opening up some space for Mount to operate in. Quite intrigued to see how that works. Similarly to Arsenal, it's like going to be interesting to see how they set up the first few games. Um, but yeah, really, really intriguing uh, sign in there, and um, yeah, it'll be interesting to see if he can start proving everyone, like Gaza in the chat saying, you know, he's never blown him away. I think it's, Mount is a good player, but I've never, he's never really hit the hype that that I've heard about him. But I think it's ball progression is what you're getting out of him in a Ten Hag team. Like you say, that Ericsson position where mm. he'll feed, he'll take from defence and feed attack. And he's got the legs to keep up with the attack to support that. Like you say, in that kind of eight position. So I think I think he'll be brilliant for Man United because he is technically very good. Mm. And in terms of ball progression and then having pace to keep up with play and transition, like he's very good at that. And he's not the guy that will blow you away. You know, he's not the guy that... Is like uh, like yeah yeah Toure in midfield or yeah. something like that, or you know he's not going to really dominate a pitch and really dominate a midfield, but similar. To, I think you'll you'll see something identical to Havertz at Arsenal, but you're just going to get really high energy technical ball player that will cover as much of the pitch as they possibly can, and will get the team up the pitch quicker. You know because that's what these guys want to do. You know they want to get forward. That's what's kind of in, uh, in, in with them. So I think Havertz next to Odegaard and I think Mount next to Bruno. I think we're going to see some very similar little parallels because then when you put Casemiro and Rice behind those midfields in question, like mm. that's a that, that's you know a great balance across three positions. You know, so I think it'll be great midfields from both from two Chelsea players in very similar positions. Yeah, and maybe that's why they you know maybe that's why at Chelsea you know neither of them really possibly yeah. Like, Possibly. I think as well, we're waiting on, obviously, like, it looks like Anana is probably going to end up at Man United if they've, you know, they, they've got a lot of work to do on the kind of the price, the cost of uh, bringing him over. But I feel like the whole David De Gea situation is in a little bit messy now um, to the point that it's hard to see how it's resolved when he's offered a contract and then we kind of turn around the next day and like, actually, no, we need to offer you a bit less than that. Like that is a slap in the face to someone who's kind of been a great servant to the club as long as he has. I know like maybe a lot of people are not a fan of his lack of ability with his feet is the big thing at the moment, isn't it? Like that's the kind of fashionable goalkeeper. It has to be someone who's comfortable passing the ball out, etc. He's not fantastic at that, but he he is a great shop stopper. He is still one of the best uh, goalkeepers in the Premier League for me. And I feel like I feel a bit sorry for him about the way the way it's kind of looks like it's going to end for him. I wouldn't be surprised if uh, 
a couple of years down the line and we get a book from him and he just completely slates the club for the way he's been treated these last few weeks. But but yeah, I think um be interesting to see if we do pick up Anana. Uh, some other interesting transfer news before we start to wind up is Gvardiol to City. Um, looks like it's on, doesn't it? That I mean, does does he slot into the starting lineup? Do you think? Like, what what do we what do we expect from him if he moves? I think he'll be a bit of a wild card. I put a wee video about it talking about how I could see him playing like left wing. You know, essentially, you know, like bombing up and down the line because he, he, people are telling me he's not a left back. He broke onto the scene at Croatia and Zagreb and initially at Leipzig playing left back, and then mm. because he is so powerful. It's only natural you're going to find him in centre back positions quite a lot because he's so huge, you know. Uh, so I think Ake is really liked by Pep, and I can see Ake not being completely displaced by this move. Um, and equally, then as a result, I could see him maybe taking up a wee bit of that John Stones position, but on the other side of the pitch, because um, yeah. John Stones is more on the right side because he's right footed. So I can see Guardiola. If John Stones wasn't playing, I could see it being Rodri and Guardiola in that kind of formation. I could see Guardiola being in the back three. I could see Guardiola taking Jack Grealish's spot for some matches, not permanently, you know, depending on who the opposition is and the matchup in question. So I think he goes straight into the team. I think he'll play more games than he doesn't. And I think he'll play in a lot of different spots. Um, uh, Joe just is saying, yeah, even playing him in centre back maybe enforces Stones better than that CDM role. And yeah, I can see that for sure. But I think he gives you he gives you so much versatility across what is kind of now three different spots the way City are set up at the moment. So I've got a Guardiola, another U23 card I'm thinking about for next year. And uh, like, no matter where he plays in that City team, he will have a lot of the stats that are cheat code for defenders, you know, forward mm-hmm. passing into the final third, attempted assist box entries etc you know and he's so physically powerful you know winning jewels and that kind of thing is always on the card so i think he's set to be a great card at city but it is the pep roulette part that comes in where you will get some games that will just fucking piss you off yeah, um, yeah. on top of those ones that will be good you know oh, i totally get that but uh, yeah we've definitely got an interesting few weeks ahead haven't we until this sort of start of the season there's still so much business to be done out there and uh, that's not just in premier league terms but you know it's so rare managerial terms um quinny is there anything that we haven't covered just yet i think we've uh we've covered a lot of huge end products from yourself we're getting the self set up for the next season and yeah we continue to speculate on when fiat wallets will come and how big the game will be over the year but yeah mate i think that's pretty much the size of it for me yeah i'd agree i think we've uh we've covered a lot of ground um, we've actually gone into injury time here. Look, we've we've managed to have <laughs> sort of 10, 20 minutes out of the podcast this week. But uh, yeah, uh, opportunity to say thanks to everyone who's been locked in uh, in the chat. We've had a lot of good interaction from everyone involved in the chat. Uh, do join us on Twitch um, live. We do this normally on a Thursday around one o'clock lunchtime. Uh, and if you did miss it and you're listening to the podcast, you can watch it back on Quinny's YouTube channel as well. He uploads it there if you want to uh, see our ugly mugs talking instead of just listening to us. Uh, and if you do watch, then you can always listen back to the podcast in the week as well via all good streaming outlets. It's been an absolute pleasure, gang, and Quinny, as always. Uh, good luck to everyone uh, in the midweek and the weekend. And hopefully we'll have some more end product to discuss on next week's show. Quinny, always a pleasure, never a chore. Gang, take care. And we'll see you again soon. Cheers all.